So what I'm going to try to do today is push, push on through, the, um, through designing samplers, uh, both from the point of view of, of having them message activated and uh, from the point of view of having them run phasers. So what happened last time, which might be worth um, a quick review, is uh, a sampler, which is able to make samples with a desirable tran desired transposition and desired size of, of place in the sample that you're going to play back, uh, driven from messages in such a way that you can do things like um, start notes. You can regard samples to be things that, that play notes. And um, I just grabbed a copy of that patch. Oh, this is the this is the patch after I edited it to put it up on the website. So this is the this is a bit cleaner than what you saw in the last class. But this is pretty much where we got um, the. The situation was this. There's a tab read tilde, or tab read four tilde, which is playing the sound. And the, the sounds are being turned on not by um, a phaser object. In other words, the, the, the control, the, the impetus of the patch isn't coming from, um, from tilde objects, from objects that make continuous streams of samples, but from messages. In this case, there's a metronome, which is uh, spitting out copies of some pitch. There you go. Oh, and this is now going to be the pitch of the thing that you hear. Okay, so what's happening is there's a metronome twice a second, a number is coming out. Oh, right, number boxes, if you send a number box a bang, such as comes out of the metronome, it simply outputs the number once. But I can also output it just by mousing on the number box itself. Right. And there was work to do, which I can always review for you if you're curious about it, but but um, for the moment, the, the idea was to figure out how far you were going to go in a fixed amount of time. And so what, what happens to the tab read 4 is it eventually gets a message to tell it to go somewhere in a certain amount of time. Um, the time is computed to be the amount of, let's see, the number of seconds that you ought to go 10,000, sorry, 100,000 samples in. So I just got out a calculator and found that out. And it was this number of milliseconds. And then, so now if you gave it 100,000, that would mean that we were playing the thing back at its own speed. And then we could also compute other speeds that were music intervals than that. And then it got all music 170-ish, trying to figure out what numbers to throw in there. All right. Questions about that? Oh, how, yeah, right. I, I didn't say that. In fact. How, how do you select what part of the audience? So really, there are two messages going in, which, in fact, perhaps I should print. Um, so let's make a print object, a regular uh, message print object, because all this is being done with messages. So, oh, actually, I'm just realizing, looking at it, that uh, it's always starting from, from the beginning. So here, we say 60, and what comes out is, sorry, two things. First the message zero, and then the message okay, and then slide to 100,000 approximately in, in the correct amount of time. And this is the only number in the pair of messages that will change when, the, when you ask it for a different pitch. We'll compute the value of that. Okay. So in fact, I've shown you other ways of making samplers where you could go in and select where in the thing you would, uh, you would play, and you could easily adapt this to do that. Uh, what you would do is, um, if you wanted to start somewhere other than zero, you would add whatever the number is to, to this zero, and you would also add it to this number here. And then you would have a thing that had a controllable offset. It's the sample. Right. The, um, the other thing that is potentially confusing about this is that you don't hear an entire uh, two, two, two point something second long sound when the thing happens. You only hear something that lasts, I forget, but a few milliseconds. And that's happening because the thing is being enveloped. So the signal processing network that you see really is this, this line is generating, the, um, is generating the addresses of the samples in this array here. Uh, this line here is turning the thing on and off, well, it's fading it in and out, uh, and it's being used as an envelope generator in classical synthesizer speak. So this is a thing which starts at zero, uh, ramps up, ooh, 
I should print that for you too. How about we do this? This is going to be the, uh, uh, what do you call that, address. And this is going to be the, this line is controlling the envelope. And the envelope, this line tilde, which is doing the envelope, is getting messages here, here, and there. So I should show you all three of those. You won't, you won't actually see the timing, but you will at least see the sequence. And I'll hit this again. And then go look for the PD window. And now what you have is, oh yeah, I didn't tell you, but you can feed print an argument and ask it to say instead of print colon something colon. So the envelope generator is getting sent to zero. And then after five milliseconds of wait, um, of delay, it sets the address to zero and the envelope generator starts ramping up. The reason to have that delay is so that you don't hear the address get reset to zero. So what, what is happening is when you give it a number, it, it doesn't actually start playing the new sample for five milliseconds because it has to take care of what else, whatever might have been happening before. Then, after uh, another, oh right, so these three things, huh, I'm not sure why they're in that order, but at any rate, what, these things should be roughly uh, at the same time. The, the, the address should be zeroed out and then should be ramped to 100,000. And meanwhile, the envelope generator should be turned back on at whatever speed, at a speed which is controlled by whatever attack time you want. And then, after, uh, after the, after you're ready to end the node, which is sometime in the future, you turn the envelope generator back off. And this thing, the, the address is still ramping at that point, presumably. Certainly is in this case, because it's only a tenth of a second in. But the fact that you multiply it by zero means that whatever is happening to the array, the tab read for, is not being heard. And so the thing effectively turned off. So again, as, as with oscillators, if you want to turn something off, you don't actually turn the oscillator off in general. Mm -hmm. The better way to do it is to cut the amplitude off by multiplying it by something that you ramp to zero. And so that's happening here with this line tilde. And now, what bothers me about this? Yeah, I guess it's all right. Okay. Questions about this? I'm going to take the print objects out as soon as I think people are okay with this. All right. So there are two topics today. One of and and they take this thing uh, in in different directions, each of which is an important direction, but this is a starting point, but they don't actually have anything to do with each other. The first one is um, going back and showing how to make something similar, but deriving it from the phaser tilde object if you want to make a looping sampler that's driven from the signal. And the second thing to show you is uh, a more interesting and general thing, which is um, how to make polyphonic stuff in general. That's to say, now I've got a nice voice of this, what, what would I do if I wanted to have eight of these and be able to play a chord or, or whatnot, a sequence that, that might be polyphonic. Um, and what I want to do, since it's simpler, is, is go over the phaser tilde driven thing first, and then that should be easy, but then the polyphonic voice allocation thing will be hard, and so that can come after. So I can close this, move on to the next thing. Right. So this is from last week. Do I want to... There are new objects, but I don't want that. I want... This. All right. So this is. Oh dear. Yeah. Uh, there are things I haven't done here. So this is the. This is a stolen from a patch that you saw sometime last week, I think. And this is uh, the way of reading from a tab read for if instead of having a line tilde generating indices into it, as to say locations or addresses you want to use a phaser to drive it. Now, line tilde will go from anything to anything depending on what messages you send it, but phaser tilde is always from a zero to one. It's just a phase generator. And phase in computer music is considered in cycles. 
And so with phaser tilde, you then have to take it and re-normalize its output to reach where it is that you want it to go. So here the, let's see, I need to get the table now. So that it was stupid of me to close that other one. Oh, it's still there. Oh, except we don't have the, this is, all right. This is what happens when you move a patch from one directory to another that uses other files. It, it, alt. So alt key. Ah. The other thing that's wrong is that I made it bigger in order to put it on the web, and now it won't fit on my screen anymore. Okay, so what I have to do is go copy this thing. Oh, how about, let's get it, let's get the, yeah, let's get this one. Okay, and now, do I have the other window? I just wanted to, come here. I just wanted to get this thing to read, make sure that's okay, and then get it. Along with this stuff, which might be useful. Okay, we're going to close that. We're going to get over here where we're actually working and put that down. Get it out of the way. Ha! Ah. All right. So now we've, we're we're back where we were before. In fact, I'm going to get properties out here. No, I'm going to do it later. Okay. So this has a bad name, but we'll we'll live. C. Okay. So this now is a thing where you you tell it how many how many per second you want. So five per second maybe, and then you tell it how big a sample you want to read in that amount of time. Say. Let's see, it's in hundreds of samples, so I'm going to ask it to read a whole second's worth. And then we we'll listen to it. Oh, so it should be one per second then, and we we'll listen to it. And now, we have this. Oops. Okay, so this is just a looping sampler, but it's a looping sampler that doesn't have a metronome that has to generate messages to make it start up. It's, it's a looping sampler that loops just because phaser tilde likes to loop, right? Uh, here again, uh, you could wish to fix the problem that whenever it loops, it has a discontinuity in the, in the sound. So to emphasize that discontinuity, let me uh, make the thing go faster and have less. So I'll have uh, fit this much. Let's see. That would be... 881, 882. Where is it? No, 88.2. Looking for a bad click. Can't hear the clicks in there. I mean, there is a click, but it's getting lost in the sound. Maybe if I make it shorter, it'll be more obvious. I'm not sure. Ooh, there we go. Uh, well, okay, this is a bad setting because I think I put it right where we were breathing in. Um, but if we start moving around the sample, maybe... I'm trying to find something that has a useful sound and has a click, but I'm not succeeding. sample. This would be a nice thing to be able to have, but it would be nice to be able to have it without the clicks. And the clicks, by the way, um, if we go faster than, than 30 a second, they won't sound like individual clicks, but they will still be a part of the sound. It'll just be, it'll just make the sound sound buzzy. So now we've got a nice little buzz generator. But this would be more useful, perhaps, if it didn't sound buzzy, right? And that buzziness is the same issue as, as the fact that it was clicking when it was going slower. Okay? Is it clear what I'm doing? I don't think I gave you this particular collection of, of window size and speed before. But what's happening is this number here is being added to 
the, res the output of the phaser that's already been ranged. And so when I'm, s when I'm changing this value, I'm changing where in the table it is. <laughs> And meanwhile, this, this portion of it is doing nothing but generating a ramp that's, that's uh, repeating at 76 times per second, so that's, the, that's controlling the pitch that you hear. And this is controlling how much of the sample you get. And a wonderful thing happens when you change that now. Get that kind of stuff. Okay, and I'll explain a little bit better why that sounds like that later. You can sort of explain that, although it takes a little bit of work. Okay, so, le le so let me go back down to a reasonable speed, perhaps 10 a second, and at this point I can find a place where it makes a click. Oh, nice, diesel motor. Anyway, um, there's a click, and now I'm going to try to get rid of it. Okay, and the way you're going to get rid of it is you're going to envelope, but it's not going to be easy to envelope this using line tilde because you don't have a source of messages that will tell line tilde to do its thing. With some work, you could do it, and uh, if you really wanted to, you would use the threshold tilde object to try to, to get a message out when this phaser crossed a certain threshold, but you'd have to figure out where in the phaser you would want to start doing the thing and so on. It would be a lot of work. So less work is just to do the smart signal based thing. Yeah? Oh, thank you. Yep. That's, uh, this turns it on and off. So this pack 050, this zero is getting overridden by one or zero, depending on whether I turn this thing on or off. Uh, which, and that relies on the fact that the toggle switch, or the toggle itself, outputs numbers, which are one or zero, depending on whether it's on or off. Okay, yeah. Can you just ask if we're like a little more commenting on the Well, I'm, I write the comments when I put them up on the website. Oh, you do? But okay. so it happens afterward, except that last Tuesday never got commented. Uh, but if you go looking on the website now, you should be finding stuff like this. Yeah, well, fine. But they're telegraphic comments. Okay, so now. What I'll do is I'll make a copy of this and fix it, so you can see the before and after. No, we don't need. Oh, you know what? Let's. Um, this is this is the first of the objects I have to introduce for today, which is make a sub window, please. Uh, actually, I've already shown you this, but I'm going to be using it again today, so I'll reintroduce it. And there we go. Go away. Put it here. decent place, and by the way, we really need to have the sample in it. Okay. So now we have a sub patch, which has the sample in it, so we don't have to look at it. All right. Now, so what we're going to do is, all, is, again, going to be to multiply the tab read 4 by something, which will make it not click. The only problem is the multiplication won't, or the only difference is that the multiplication won't be by a line tilde output. It'll have to be by something else. And what? <laughs> Well, the answer is um, deceptively simple. You so phaser, uh, phaser is going from zero to one, and you want the thing to be zero at the beginning, and then you want it to go up to some value like one, and then you want to stay at one for a while, perhaps, and then go back down to zero. Right? Well, you can do that algebraically in a variety of different ways. The simplest way to do it would be this. So recall that if you just, oh, did I tell you about cosine tilde? I think I threatened to tell you about this and then didn't. Or did I? I should have. If I told you about cosine tilde, it would have been first week. This is a thing which takes things that go from 0 to 1 and turns them into the cosine of the thing that went from 0 to 1. In fact, at this point, it would be a good thing to have another table to just look at the output. So what I'll do is put another table, um, an array that's going to be scope. And it needs to have, I don't know, some samples in it. I'll make it a tenth of a second. Okay. There we 
Uh, and now, for instance, if I look at what the phaser is putting out, so that we can see it. The phaser will be putting out zeros until I get the frequency. Let's give it a frequency of 20. And then we'll see sawtooth wave. And I made this thing be a tenth of a second long, so maybe that's a little bit not enough. But um, since I made this thing be 20 hertz, 20 cycles per second, there are two cycles in one tenth of a second. It's all correct. Right? So now if I just take the cosine of that, Get that sort of thing, and that's all right. Except, oh, and its its value is one at the beginning and end of the phaser. So when the phaser outputs either zero or one, the cosine puts out a one. Right? Yeah. Is this the opposite phase in? Yeah. So now what you need to do is get it to put zero out instead of one. So you need to put it upside down. So the way to do this is then to multiply it by a half. Sorry, multiply it by minus a half. You can't actually see the fact that it got multiplied by minus a half because you don't see that these points are now the points, the zero points of phase. If I made it graph both the phaser and the cosine, you can see that. And now that we've got that, we can adjust it so that it goes down to zero instead of going down to minus a half. You do that just by adding 0.5. Whoops, plus. And then, ta-da, we've got a thing which goes, which starts at zero, ramps up to one, and then ramps back down to zero. Okay, now this takes a bit of thought to get figured out, so I should stop here and make sure everyone is with us. So what we wanted is for the, should I, should I try to graph the phaser too? That would be, yeah, why not? Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to say, let's put another array, but I'll put it in the previous graph. Scope two, and I'll say this is going to be the same size. Okay, now we have two two things getting shown in the same graph. And now what I'm going to do is make two tab rights controlled by the same button, so you can see both of them simultaneously. <coughs> so I'm going to show you the phaser and the result. Ooh, okay. So the phaser is going from 0 to 1 like this, and then jumping back down to 0. And the cosine <coughs> wave that I'm making is going through 0 when the phaser is at either end of its trajectory. The original cosine was not suitable because it had two flaws. One is it didn't stop at 0, it went all the way negative. And the second thing is, it wasn't at its least value at the end of the, at, at the transition point of the phaser where you want the thing to be off. This hits its maximum. So the first step is to invert it by multiplying it by minus a half. And that gives you this. Now we've got, now we've got the, the thing hitting its minima when the phaser changes phase from one to zero. So this is a good thing, but it's not at zero anymore. It's at minus one half. So now we're going to add a half, and then instead of going from minus a half to plus a half, we go from zero to one. If you want to be fancier, you could ask for the thing to have a different transition shape or have a different amount of time that it transitions from zero to one besides just the entire half of the, of the cycle that, that this one takes to transition from zero to one. But for right now, I'm just going to do the simplest possible thing, which is just this. This is, um, oh, right. So, that, so this is multiplying by minus a half, and then adding a half, then gives you this. This is 
uh, this thing, the cosine, this cosine is, um, what's the right word? Sometimes called a raised cosine. It, it has a name. It's sometimes called the Han window. And people use it also to multiply uh, snippets of signal by before they take a Fourier transform of it in order to do um, either frequency domain analysis of it or convolve it with something else or something like that. So you will see this trick of taking a cosine wave and raising it so that it's tangent to the horizontal axis and then multiplying it by a signal in order to control how it acts at both ends of it. You'll see that again and again over the course of this in the next quarter. So one cycle of this is called a Han window sometimes. And there's, a, there's a cycle there. And what, this, and what this patch is doing is doing them end to end. So you can think of the patch not as just making a continuous sound, but also, if you like, it's making a succession of Han windows, a pulse train, if you like, which is pulsing every time the uh, phaser cycles. And the maximum of the pulse is in the middle of the cycle of the phaser. Yeah? So, if you replace the phaser with you, If we use this to generate the index into the table, that's exactly what would happen. And that would be interesting. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I don't want to hear it right now, but that would be a thing to try. But what we, uh, but the reason I'm doing this is so that uh, we can take the original table, and, uh, sorry, the original sample output, the sound output, multiply by this in order to control its amplitude. Right. So instead of going into the tab read four to control the, the location that it's reading at, I'll take this thing and multiply it by the output. And then, uh, let's see, I should get these two to have the same value so you can compare them. So this is 10. This is 14. This is 86. So here's the original one. And here's the windowed one. Okay. Now, you could either like this more or less, right? It's, this is not a thing that you have to do because this is right and the other thing is wrong. It's just that this has a spectrum that more, more correctly imitates the, the spectrum or sound of the original uh, sound that we Whereas this, it's got more highs, and you could like that, but it also has more distortion in some sense. It's a, um, you, hear, you hear something that wasn't really present in the original sound. Questions about this? Yeah. Yeah. There is. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, so right, so that's another whole thing that you could do. Rather than rather than take this thing and take the highs out by windowing it, you could also take the highs out by low pass filtering it, but you would also take the highs of the original sample out. Whereas here, if the original sample has highs, they'll still be there when you window it. They'll, you know, they'll, they'll be different in some way, but they'll still be there. Yeah. More other questions? Yeah. Okay, so, so this multiplication by this window, and let me clean this up a little bit so you can see a bit better what's happening. this not collide with itself. Okay, so, so this is the same as that. What I added was this multiplier, and that corresponds to the multiplying by the line tilde in the other realization of the sampler. And it just had to be done differently because we didn't have a source of, let's see. Yeah, I don't have any more. This one. Multiplying this by this, sorry, this line, which is the envelope generator, which was controlling the other one. This was feasible because I had a sequence of messages here generated by a metronome. The other one, I didn't have the sequence of messages because it was generated by a phaser tilde, which is operating continuously. It's an audio signal. And so I had to do something different. 
this is perhaps more flexible, but at the same time, it's, well, it's more complicated. And there are also some disadvantages with it. In particular, these uh, messages happen between audio samples. In fact, they happen between blocks of audio samples. So what really happens downstairs in PD is that PD grinds out 64 samples at a time in order to be efficient. And these messages actually happen on 64 sample boundaries. PD tries to hide this fact, but at the same time what that means is that you don't have sample accuracy in when the tab read 4 actually started reading a new sample. And so if you want that level of accuracy, uh, it's more appropriate, I think, to use the signal approach rather than this, this approach. On the other hand, if you have MIDI coming in to start things out, you don't have that accuracy anyway, and this is the better approach. So they just both coexist, and you have to, you know, you just sort of have to get a sense of when to try one and when to try the other. It's clear what the distinction is between these two. Now what I'm going to do, yeah, so that's, that's kind of done this. Yeah. So now what I'm going to do, not, not to belabor this anymore, because now I can launch a whole diatribe about how to, how to make different kinds of envelope shapes, which would be a lot of fun, but that's for a little bit later on in the quarter, I think. Uh, uh, but right now I want to just start working on polyphonic voice allocation so that you can turn this thing into fun instruments that you think are the chords. Okay, so to do that, uh, the, the main tool is going to be the fact that you can put things in sub-patches with an interesting twist, and this is all PD lore as opposed to real computer music knowledge. Um, the twist is that in PD you can um, ask it to have a patch loaded from a different file into a sub-window, and if you do that, then you can have multiple copies of the sub-window, and when you edit one of them, they, they will all be edited in a way that that stays coherent. This, is, this doesn't sound all that important yet because obviously you can make eight copies of something and if you want to change it, you just change it in all the eight copies, but it will become important <laughs> as things get more complicated to be able to keep things coherent. And the way you do that is very simple in principle and then in the details it gets complicated. So first I'll show you the simplicity in principle and then I'll make everything unbearably complicated for the next half hour. So uh, let's see, what I'm going to do is let's save this and I think for pedagogical reasons it would be smarter to start with the other flavor of sampler which I already closed. So this one. Except that I'm going to rebuild it for the most part. But just for now, um, let's, let's, um, let's call zero sampling envelope, right? So now what we're going to do is make a new patch, and then we're going to put an object, and we're just going to say zero sampling envelope. And then if I open this, I get my nice patch. And furthermore, if I ask for several of these, I have copies of zero sampling envelope, and notice I'm getting all sorts of errors because I'm doing things that I shouldn't do with, that I shouldn't have copies of. Like things that are named, you shouldn't have copies of that have the same name because then how, how we can distinguish them. Okay. So, um, that's basically it. I mean, that's, that's how you cause a patch to, to load other patches. And, and now if I wanted a five or eight voice sampler, I would load eight of these things. And then I would do the hard part, which is figuring out how to get messages into, into them appropriately to do what it is that I want to do. So if someone says, play three notes, I don't want to tell the same voice to play all three notes. I want to choose three, three of the voices and assign one note to each of those voices. And then I have to have them not be able to make, be able not to be mixed up about which one of them is doing what. Right? And that, that takes bookkeeping and, and attention to detail, which I will now show you how to deal with. <coughs> Questions about what I've done so far? So the first thing I can, yeah, I was just wondering, we do sub patch and you want to re-edit it after you make it, is that a problem? Or do you just um, it? It's okay, but uh, here's the thing, I can change, I can edit this, say I'll move this somewhere, and it won't have been edited in the other one until I hit save, ooh, that's interesting, until I hit save in, in this one, and then when I save it, then the others will all have the same edit, whoa. I'll just do cancel. And then the others have the same change. 
Now, notice, by the way, this one didn't lead, read the sound files because I told it to read it in a message by name, and it didn't know which one of these tables I meant when I named it because they all had the same name. Oops, so we have to deal with it with that. Right now, my way of dealing with it is going to be brute force and stupid. I'm going to take this, get rid of it, and by the way, I'll hit save so I get rid of it in all three of them, and then go back and do what I showed you before. TV, here, and by the way, I'll just whack the load bang action so that we'll get it. So now we have three things, all of which amount to sub-patch. Ooh, I just made a bad mistake. I actually saved this patch. <laughs> well, it's all right. It's a copy from another, uh, from another day. It's, so I can, um, so the, the original patch is still there. Okay, so now we have two different kinds of sub-patches. This one is called by a file name, and this one is called by saying PD, and this one will be saved as part of this patch. So this is now part of this, anything that I put inside here is part of this document. And if I change something in here, the change is reflected by, oh, let me save this thing so I don't get in trouble later. So this is going to be three, And it's, um, I'm going to be optimistic and call it a polyphonic sampler. Okay. All right, now, what we need to do is get messages into sampling envelope that cause it to do things. In fact, since it's a polyphonic sampler, let me um, do something that's going to be essential for our mental health, which is to have the array actually be this one. Whoops, don't have it. All right, I wasn't going to tell you this, but rather than rather than move that one in, I'm just going to call it by its relative path name. I'll fix this later. Okay, and I'm going to have that be the load back action. That's because I want to be able to have different pitches of it and have to be able to hear it. And if, it's, if it's saying we have another three, whatever, you know, soft and relaxing, it's going to be harder to hear what's going on. Okay, so now. If I want to hear one voice of it, for instance, I could go in here and say 60. Yeah, there it is. So now I have a nice. Right? Monophonic sampling, right? Cool. Now, how do I make it polyphonic? Well, first off, we probably shouldn't have the metronome in here, but what we should have is an inlet. Now when I say inlet, notice that it puts an inlet on this box. In fact, when I save this box, it's going to put an inlet on all three of them. And that inlet corresponds to the fact that I said inlet, which is, it, which is an object whose purpose is to put an inlet on the patch if it ever gets called as a sub-patch, as an abstraction. Okay. So this is one of two ways you can get messages and signals into and out of sub-patches, uh, which is you just make inlets and outlets on them and then you just connect to things. Um, I should say at some point, there is such a thing as inlet and also uh, as inlet tilde, like this, which is the signal version of it, which makes an inlet that expects audio signals. That's a different thing from from making an inlet that expects messages. And you'll see that later in gory detail. I'm going to try to keep things simple today. Just within it. Right. So now, this is kind of cool. I now have a, let's see, let's save this and close it. Now I've got something where I can say, for instance, number, whoops, I don't know what I think I should go in and make the envelope be a little bit more assertive, like this. There we go. So 50 milliseconds was too slow for having the voice start in that particular instrument. Okay, 
now, for instance, if I want nice uh, major chords, I'll say, okay, why don't we add four to be up of musical third, and then let's add another, oh, actually, let's make it simpler conceptually, and add seven, which is a musical fifth. This is just to, just to prove to you that this thing is actually polyphonic. Now if I say 60, I get the whole triad. I forget who it was. Well, uh, Conlon Nankaro has a lot of music that sounds like this, but someone did it. Okay. Anyway, you've, you've all heard this kind of sound, right? right. Um, questions about this? Yeah. Yeah, you have to connect it to the copies or somehow distribute the messages to the copies because this copy is actually going to be doing this pitch and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, control D for duplicate. Uh, anytime you have something that's that's um, selected, you can hit command or control D and it duplicates the whole thing. Like you can even do it to a whole thing like that. Oh, gee, now i got two of them, so now I can do this. Right. Well, actually, I can have as many of these now as my computer can run. And you haven't had any trouble with not, your computer not being able to run things yet, probably, but now you will be able to make yourself trouble having your computer actually run everything. Yeah? Yeah. It's a, if you like, it's a whole new kind of object that I've made today that's not part of PD, but it's part of my own private library. Yeah? Did you, like, kind of put those in order with it play? If you put, like, a DAC at the bottom, it would go one to the other? Well, mm -hmm. yeah, there are, there are two things you could do along those lines. Like, one of our home systems, like, if you did a patch for each node, and then we kind of made them up like that. Yeah, but it would be smarter to, to have just a single one and have a sequence of different pitches going to it because you don't need them to overlap. You just, in other words, it's, it's, it's easier to control something if you have a monophonic synthesizer to send a sequence of things than it is to have a polyphonic thing that follows each other. For instance, if you want to say do, re, mi and get a trumpeter to do it, you don't get three trumpeters and say each one to play a note. You just They're not polyphonic, but they're the same, but yeah. you just do it by recording. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, on the other hand, you can, for instance, ask it to do these things that are arpeggiated. Yeah. This is a slight aside, but there's a wonderful object called pipe, which remembers numbers and puts them out after a delay. So if you want to make rounds or cannons, you do this. This is, a, this is not exactly an answer to your question, but it's a, it's a related idea. Now if I hit 60, you get, right? And now whatever I do, it'll be a major chord. Yeah. How is pipe different from delay? Pipe will remember as many, no okay, first off, delay gives you bangs, and pipe will actually remember numbers. Uh, pipe will remember as many numbers as you give it so that if you do this, you will get, you know, that's not a good example because it's too fast. Let's make it be a second. Two seconds. Oh, wait, there's too much going on, so let me just not have this one. So now I'll say... Right. So what's happening, oh, I should do it this way. This thing remembers numbers, but it also can remember more than one number at a time, so that it'll remember a whole sequence of things that happens. So it's actually a memory object as opposed to a delay, which doesn't remember stuff. This is useful. It's not as useful as you think it's going to be, because 
it doesn't turn out to be a, a generally. Let's see what I'm saying. It, it doesn't turn out to be generally that frequent that you want to have exactly the same sequence of stuff come out after a delay of time. I mean, occasionally you want it, but it's more likely that you want to do something that varies how things change in such a way that pipe no longer becomes the right solution. And there's no way to sort of build it out into something better. It just is what it is. Also, when you send a whole bunch of stuff in, then suddenly you might say, well, actually, why don't you just forget the third and fifth things that I told you, but remember all the others? But there's no way in pipe to do that. And so design pattern and computer music, it's actually not good to have to schedule a whole bunch of stuff into the future and then have it happen. It's better to always schedule the very next thing that's going to happen in case you're going to change tempo or, or change some, some other aspect of what you're going to do. Because then you might find out that all that good stuff that you've scheduled, you have to repeat anyway. So pipe does the wrong thing, which is just schedule a whole bunch of stuff into the future. Okay. So that was... That was just sort of a, an answer to a question as opposed to useful information. Okay, so here's now back to the triad generator, right? Okay, other questions about this? How would I, let's see, why is this not useful? What's the next thing you want to do? Hook it up to a keyboard, maybe, because I don't have a keyboard, so that's, that's not a problem for me right now. Um, how about changing the lengths of the notes or changing other qualities of them? Right, right now, they're short and kind of brutal. And maybe you would want to do something that would allow you to say, well, make me a chord that lasts a half second or a second long, and have that be another parameter that you send it. Right? And that's, that's kind of a typical thing that you might want, wish to do. So. So really, what you might want to be able to do is have, uh, so would you want to have a whole bunch of different inlets to this thing? Maybe not, because if I decided to have like 10 inlets to control 10 different aspects of how the sampler works, yep, this doesn't have 10 controls on it, it has maybe five or six things to control right now. But um, by the time you have eight of these and, and maybe a half dozen inlets on it, you've got a lot of wires running around. And you're going to really want to use pack and unpack, which are things which will allow you to take uh, numbers and combine them into messages that have more than one value in it so that you can not have wires flying all over the place, each one of which just carries one number. Right. So one thing that you're really going to want to do, so let's, let me just make the thing now for, um, so let's, why don't I save this one, or rather leave this one the way it is and, and then work on a new one. Save as for all the sampler duration. Okay. So now 0.sampling.envelope, if I go changing it, it's going to change it for both of these patches, which could be a good thing, but for right now it's not going to be a good thing. So I'm going to save it as something else. Go in here and say save as. Now it's going to be a sampler voice with length duration. Oh, that's a terrible idea because now we're going to have to type that whole thing out. <laughs> and if I get one letter wrong, it'll fail. Okay, now my plan is going to be I'm going to put lists of two numbers in and the, li and the numbers are going to be a pitch and a duration. Right? And the pitch will be just what it is and the duration will be milliseconds. And it's going to be easy, right? Oh, we can do these. I'm going to want more of these later, but for right now let's just have one of them. Okay, so what we're going to do is here we're going to have to pack, use the pack object to put messages together that have, actually it's, to start with, let's just do it the most simple-minded way, which is to pack two numbers, one of which is going to supply the duration and one of which is going to supply the pitch. Oh. <coughs> so now I'm going to say duration 1,000 and pitch 60, and it's going to last a second, right? No, 
know, because why didn't it, why doesn't this work? Uh, sort of, it's yeah, it's sort of that. I'm, I'm even being more simple than that. I didn't change the abstraction to do anything with the other number, so of course it can't do anything with it. I didn't fix it. Okay, so go in here. <coughs> now this inlet is getting two. Uh, oh yeah, right. If if a number box gets a message with two numbers in it, it just takes the first number. You could do a, a variety of different things, but that's the way it does it. So really, what we want to do is just unpack the other number. here. So that's all we need is an unpack object, which by default expects two numbers. And this one is now going to be a duration in milliseconds, which I think is just going to be the value of this delay. Ta-da. Oh, delay. The first inlet, you send it a bang to schedule a bang to come out after the amount of delay. And, and the second inlet changes the delay time, so it receives numbers. Uh, and as a shortcut, you can feed it a number into the first inlet, and that will not only set the delay time, but also arm the delay. In other words, also schedule the set off. But this is the more readable way of doing it. I'm just going to set the number here, and then all this stuff is going to happen, which, by the way, is going to start the delay off. All right, and I'm going to save that. And now, let's see, maybe it's already going to work. Dig. That's too easy. It's still true that when I tell it something new, it has to steal the voice from the old one. Oh, stealing voice. That's, uh, that's MIDI talk. Um, voice stealing is when you have a thing here, which is a voice. Voices are... Oh, voices. Voices are... That's borrowed from corral talk. A voice is, is a person standing up saying something, but in uh, computer music talk, it's a thing which is able to make one pitch at a time. And the idea here is that uh, if you, uh, each pitch is going to be made by one of several identical sub patches. So that's, that's what voice is. And so the um, stealing the voice means if I have the thing playing and suddenly give it another pitch, before the first one is done, I want it to cleanly stop playing the previous one and start playing the new one. And all the machinery is already in there to do that. What it had to do then was mute the thing by, by multiplying, by taking the line tilde that drives the output and ramping it hurriedly to zero. And then uh, resetting the, the phase to, to the beginning. Sorry, resetting the location in the array to the beginning and, and starting a whole new one of that. Okay. And now we've got everything we need to do this polyphonically, except for one other thing, which is this. Now suppose I want to be able to give it a bunch of numbers and have it not just steal the same one, but allocate a new voice each time so that you can do it all separately. Then what you need to do, and this is going to be work, then what we need to do is have a bank of these and have each time you give it a new one, choose a different one of them to send the message to. So what we need is a, like an automobile distributor which will send the spark to the cylinder that, that is supposed to go off next in sequence. Okay. So we know how to generate those numbers just fine. That's this, uh, that's this kind of patch which you've already seen. You'll need a floating point number and then a plus one. That makes a loop. And let me just make that loop first and then you can see that's good for. That's, that's counting, but now what we're really going to do is we're going to say we want some number of voices. I'll just make there be eight because it's a reasonable number. So what I really want to do is count to eight. So let's say plus one, all right, but then modulo eight. Then we're counting zero through seven. Right. And now, if we wanted to, we could. Well, let's see. I have to introduce a new object now, which is. I'll just do the. I won't do the simple one. I'll do the one that we're really going to need. So there is an object sitting here called route, 
which um, looks at messages and simply routes them according to what the first number in the message is. So for instance, if I give it the number 0 through 7 to look for, if I give it a 7, it, doesn't, it puts it out this outlet, but if I give it a 0, it puts it out that one. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 0, and so on. It has, by the way, eight outputs because the, let's see, that's the reason for eight outputs, because uh, there's a last one which is, uh, which outputs it if it didn't match any of the numbers I gave it, which is always a possibility. And I didn't have to give it exactly these numbers. I could have said I only care about numbers five and six or something like that. But in this case, I want all the possible numbers that this can, that this can generate to make outputs. And now it's even worse than that because what I really want to do is have route, uh, I'm going to just demonstrate this. I want to have route take this kind of message and somehow route that message according to this number. Right? So what I need is a message with three objects in it. So we're going to have to have a pack with three numbers in it. And the first number is going to have to be the number that we route according to. The second and third numbers are going to be these numbers here, except that I want the thing to change whenever I wiggle this number just to make it easy. So what I really want is whenever I get a message out of here, it's going to stuff these values in here and then make this thing go. All right? So to do that, I have to unpack it again. This looks ridiculous that we're doing pack followed by unpack, but actually it happens all the time that you have to do that. This is now the value of 1,000, so we'll put it there. This is the value of 58, and we'll put it here. And then we're going to bang that, but we care what order we do those two things in. Because we want to bang this after this number has gone in. So we need our old friend trigger. I'll use the abbreviation trigger, bang, float. Let's see, how's this sound going? I'm going to bang this, but meanwhile we're going to throw this in here. And then, let's just look at that to see how we're doing. Print. All right, and now, each time I give it a new number, out comes a triple of numbers, which consist of the voice it chose, and then the pitch I gave it, and then the velocity, or sorry, duration I gave it. And this would be an excellent moment to stop and fish for questions. Ah, yeah, I'm not doing that. I'm not using that yet. Oh, so so what I'm gonna what that, what that's gonna be good for is this this first number is going to be which of the eight sub-windows I want to send the message to, and route is going to do that for us. Yeah? No. It, it'll strip the number, yeah. Ah, so that's the next thing to do, is just send this thing in here. So I'm going to call this before and after. Oh, well, sorry about the caps. Uh, caps lock. Okay, and now we start doing this. And, yeah, actually after came before, but anyway, whenever the thing is zero, you, whenever the thing, um, whenever the message starts with zero, the route zero matched and it came out here. And by the way, it gave me the other two messages, or sorry, the other two numbers, which is what I want to feed the sub. Patch voice. And now we're done because now we just make. I'm going to leave that there. Now we just make eight of these and have them talk to this. <laughs> all right. Are we going to get it all on one screen? I could have chosen a smaller number, couldn't I? No. I'm going to make eight of these. You can tell I've done this before. I know which way to organize them. 
Oops. Uh, let's see. I didn't make the right number of them though yet. Computer scientists hate this because I'm actually manually iterating something and, and of course the program should be smart enough to, to do the work of doing, of doing these eight connections for me. Now I've got polyphonic sampling. Right? Or actually to really prove that this is doing what I think it's doing, let's give it a nice chord like this. Um, 60... Notice the commas, that means send both messages, please. Um, uh, all right, this will be horrifying. I'm going to put it right there. <laughs> Ta-da, OK. So what's happening here is the, it's, it's, this is the same thing as if I had somehow simultaneously managed to type those numbers all into here. So each one of these things generates a message, and in fact you see here what it did to them, which is, I don't know, but whatever that was, six numbers. Oh wait, it starts here. Each got assigned a voice number, and then here are the, the, the six pitches that you see that I typed in there, and here's the durations I asked for. More on this next time. <laughs> <laughs>